Uh, I have mentioned this story before, but uh, I know there's a lot of new people here, and it kind of fits in with what we're talking about this morning. Uh, there was a time when Asher, my, my son Asher, who's almost 16 now, uh, he was just a toddler, and we were, we were living at my parents' house, and he came down with croup. Um, and for any parent who's had a child that's come down with croup, you know it is just one, especially if it's your first time, it's, it's one of the most horrible experiences. I mean, it's just this awful, and you, you, they sound like they're dying with every cough. And I was, I was really, really worried about him. And so uh, I decided I was going to stay the night with him. And so I, and I was going to pray all night long. And so, I mean, there were times I fell asleep, of course. But every time he woke up with a little, you know, I woke up and I would pray. And I was, I was praying with such faith that he would be healed. I mean, I, I think I had just written a paper for school about, about the, the, what we believe in the Alliance, that, that you can be physically healed by the power of God. And I was, I was, I was saying, man, I just, if I believe enough that it's going to happen, if I have enough faith that it's going to happen, then it's going to happen. And, uh, you know, taking the, totally the sovereignty of God out of the picture, you know, it was all about what I wanted. Um, and I was just saying, you know, if I just pray strong enough and I just pray hard enough, and I, I was so sure it was going to happen that, you know, in the midst of, of these prayers, my mind started to wander, and I started thinking about, you know, this healing ministry that I was going to have after my son was healed, and that I would be able to, you know, pray for other people and, and heal, because I'd figured out, you know, all you need to do is have enough faith. Uh, at least that was my thinking at the time. Um, and so we woke up in the morning, and my son was still, <laughs> he still had this croupy cough, and I couldn't understand what went wrong. I couldn't understand why, uh, why he wasn't healed. Again, taking the sovereignty of God out of it, and, and probably, you know, looking back now, it, it wasn't as big a deal as I thought it was. You know, other kids have survived this thing called croup. Um, and I, uh, I think really what it was all about was that I was trying to make this all about myself. It wasn't really even about my son. It certainly wasn't about God. It was all about myself. And, and you know, what's going to happen when I'm able to heal my son? And so I made it about me. Uh, we talked last week about how we like to make things all about ourselves. You know, it, I or me, you know, being the, the most common... Uh, pronoun in the English language. We, we always like to make things about ourselves. You know, some, some tragedy happens, and it's like, how can, I, how can I get involved in this in a way that people know that I care about this? You know, how can I put my thing on Facebook and say, you know, how do, how do I get myself into this situation? Even if you're not really thinking that, there's, there's I think, a part of us that has, has that desire, and, and one of the reasons that we do some of the things we do. There's, there's just something about us that wants to put the focus on ourselves. This morning we are starting a new series for the summer called Miraculous. And we are looking at the miracles of Jesus and looking at some of the things that he did that were, were just unbelievable. Uh, and, and the reason they're unbelievable is because there's no other explanation for it other than that that is the power of God that made something happen. And when we talk about miracles, we have to ask the question, is that something we can really believe in? You know, can we really believe in miracles? Are miracles possible? Uh, if you follow philosophy at all, you've probably heard the name David Hume. And David Hume said no. In fact, a lot of people think, I, I've, I've heard Christians say, well, you know, David Hume pretty much annihilated the possibility of, of miracles with some of his philosophy. And, you know, I, I certainly haven't studied Hume to the extent that other people have, but I looked at what his, his understanding of miracles were, and I thought, really all he's done is given, given a type of proof that God exists. Because what he says is that there are certain things that are just not possible to happen. And I would agree with that. And yet if they do happen, then that means it was a miracle. I mean, I'll, my understanding of what Hume came up with was that just there are some things that are beyond the realm of possibility. And again, he's totally right. And that's where the whole word miracle comes in. When something happens that goes against the law of nature, against, the law of possi- like, uh, against all possibility other than the fact that God stepped in, then that's got to be a miracle. Um, I would also say to David Hume, if I could, I would say you exist. I mean, that's a miracle. Anyone who says miracles don't exist are contradicting the fact that they are alive. Because when you look at the, the possibilities of of human life being here on earth, it, it is nothing short of a miracle. Jesus created everything out of nothing. I mean, you read, you read the book of Genesis, and you know, God spoke it into being. I mean, there was nothing, and then he spoke, and then 
something existed. I mean, what is that if not a miracle? Uh, and so I would say our entire existence is miraculous. The other thing I would say is that we don't get to pick and choose what parts of the Bible we believe. If there is something that is in the Bible and it's written in the Bible, we have to accept that or throw out the entire Bible. Because you, I mean, how could you say, well, I don't believe in this, but I, I do believe in this. You know, how can I believe that Jesus died and came back to life, which, by the way, is a miracle, if I'm not willing to accept the fact that Jesus walked on water? Also, if Jesus created water, why would he have any... Uh, well, <laughs> we could get sidetracked on talking about the, the possibilities of miracles when you're talking about the God of the impossible. Um, and that's, that's the thing. We, we may not understand how it's, po- how it's possible. We may not understand how God does it. In fact, it's most likely we will not understand how he does it. But we do not get to, ca- we do not get to tell God what he can and cannot do. The thing is, because we are egocentric, because we like to make things all about ourselves and think about ourselves, we might start to think, if we do witness a miracle, if there's any kind of miracle that happens in our lives, we might start to think that the reason behind the miracle is to magnify ourselves. We might start to think it's about us. You know, if I could, if I could pray enough and my son is healed, then it's all about me, right? And, not, and taking the focus off of God. So what I want us to know this morning is that the goal of miracles, the goal of a miracle is to glorify God. The goal of a miracle is to glorify God. Uh, God may have his own reasons for doing it, but the result of it should be the glorification of God. And so we are going to look this morning at Jesus' first miracle. And that takes place in the book of John, chapter 2, verse 1 to 11. If you have your Bible or phone with you, you can open that up. Uh, I will have some of the the, uh, text on screen. So it's, this chapter starts with the words, the next day. Uh, and, and possibly it may actually be the third day, depending on, on the translation. But whenever you see something like that, you kind of have to say, well, what happened before that? At least I do. If I start reading a, the, the story and it says, the next day, I said, oh, well, that makes me wonder what was the first day? You know, what happened before this? And so if you go back to John chapter 1, I mean, you've got the beginning of, of John's explanation of who God is or who Jesus is. You know, he's... He's throwing out there some very, very important theology for us, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God at the beginning, and that tells us that that Jesus was co-eternal with the Father, and all kinds of interesting things that 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 plays out. But then he gets into the the, the story, and tells about Jesus' very first days. I mean, Luke, Luke and Matthew tell us about the beginning of Jesus' life. John just starts with the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And what happens is, we see, is that he starts, he starts going around and, and gathering disciples. And that's how that chapter ends, with Jesus gathering his disciples. And then it says, the next day, or possibly the third day, you know, but right after this, so Jesus has gone out and he's gathered all his disciples, you know, come follow me, and they follow him. And then the very next day, there's a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. And Jesus' mother was there. Um... And then Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. Which makes me, you know, if I'm, I'm reading this and studying this and thinking, those people could not possibly have known that Jesus was going to roll up with a whole bunch of guys. Right? I mean, this, this must have been a bit of a surprise for them. You know, usually with a wedding, you might get a plus one. Jesus is coming along with, you know, a plus 11 or... 12. I mean, I, I don't think they had Matthew at this point, but anyway. Um, he just, a whole bunch of guys all of a sudden with him. Hey, is it okay if my boys come? And, you know, it, certainly in that culture, you, you wouldn't want to lose face. You'd be like, sure, the more the merrier. Come on in. Uh, and so there's this wedding celebration, and I think that might factor into the story here. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But there's this wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Now this is, uh, Jesus spent a lot of his ministry in this one little area, um, geographically speaking, compared to the, the world at large. Um, it still would have been a pretty decent walk, probably, from where he was the day before. But what's interesting here is that Jesus' mother was there. It doesn't say anything about Jesus' father at this point. Uh, Joseph is, is surely passed on by now. Um, but it, Jesus' mother is there. So if Jesus is there, and Jesus' mother is there, and we also hear from tradition that Jesus, the rest of Jesus' family was there, we don't know who's getting married, but uh, it is, there's reason to believe it's probably someone that Jesus is related to. 
uh, maybe a cousin or some distant cousin, some, some part of the family that, that he's now been invited to the wedding and now he shows up with all these guys. And here's where I think it matters that he shows up with all these guys. You get to verse 3 and it says, the wine supply ran out during the festivities. So I was reading about this and uh, in those days a wedding might last for an entire week. And so if you were going to have a wedding, you would want to make sure you were prepared. You want to make sure you had enough food, make sure you had enough wine, make sure that everything was taken care of, that, that when you're going to throw a party, it's going to be a good party for the entire time of the party. And if you didn't, it would be very, very embarrassing, much more than, than like if, if you come over to my house and I offer you a drink and be, oh, sorry, we're actually out of Coke. You know, is water okay? It's not a big deal. But if, in those days, if you ran out of wine, it would have been incredibly embarrassing. In fact, it probably would have, uh, would have affected your, in, your entire reputation for as long as you live in that town. People would look at you and be like, oh yeah, that's the guy who doesn't, you know, he's poor. He doesn't have enough to, to make the party go long enough. You know, it, it would actually be a bad sign for your marriage. And so we read the, the wine supply ran out during the festivities, and it's not a big deal to us, but for them, I mean, this was a significant thing. This was, this was an important thing. And it's probably somebody we think, that Jesus was related to. And so it's some extended family member of, of Jesus and his... They're, they're at risk of, of being really embarrassed and shamed. And so Jesus' mother told him, they have no more wine. And Jesus' response is not the warmest response you'd expect for a guy talking to his mother. I mean, if my mom came and told me something and I responded the way Jesus did, um, she'd probably be a little put out. But we also have to understand uh, this, this is not meant to be... It, it doesn't translate as well. Okay. Um, so she says, mother comes to him and says, we have no more wine. And his response is, depending on your translation, New, New Living Translation actually, which I use, is actually even a little nicer than, than most. And he says, dear woman, that's not our problem. Again, this is not what you expect from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, right? This is not expect, knowing what we know about Jesus, to res- respond to his mother. Mom comes to him with a problem. He's like, yeah, not my problem. It, except it's not really like that. Okay? And he doesn't say mom. He says dear woman. Now, um, it, it really, the, the dear part, I think the New Living Translation does get it really, it, it, it does a good job of explaining here. He's saying to her, you know, you, you are a dear woman. But this isn't, this isn't the right time. Okay? He, you know, he knows what she's asking. So, Again, we have to go back, not in the book of John, but in what we know about Jesus and, and Mary. And Mary, before Jesus was born, knew that he was going to be someone special, right? She knew that he was going to be the Messiah. He, she knew that he was going to have power that, that others wouldn't have. And so this time comes, and it's, it's kind of like, like, this is 30 years later. And, and Mary is maybe saying to Jesus, you know, like, I think it's time. And Jesus is saying, it's not time. It's not, it's not the time for me to be recognized for who I am. And, and so it, it's not that he doesn't care about what's going on here. It doesn't, it's not that he, he doesn't care about the people who are going to be embarrassed. He's just saying, the time has not come for me to reveal myself to the world. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Um, so now we have some new characters coming in the story, the servants. So you've got, you've got the, the, the bride and groom who are going to be embarrassed. You've got probably the extended family of Jesus and Mary, who, who are sort of part of the story now. You've got the servants and, and Mary who just has this faith that her son is going to come through. Her faith that her son is going to do something miraculous. Even though he says to her, it's not my time yet, she says, just do whatever he, whatever he tells you. He'll find a way to make this work out. And the servants surely don't want to see you know, their, their master lose face, and so they're, they're willing to do whatever he tells them. It says, standing nearby were six stone water jars used for, Jer- for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. And so I, I don't really know what 20 to 30 gallons looks like. I mean, I'm, I use liters when I fill up my gas tank. So I was looking this up. And you know those blue barrels, blue plastic barrels that are about this high, waist, waist high, about this big around? That's what they're talking about. And there's six of these jugs standing there. And so Jesus told the servants, he said, fill the jars with water. And if you're a servant here, you're probably thinking, why? You know, I've got other duties to attend to. Sure, we're out of wine, but there's probably still other things I need to do. Why would I waste my time filling these jars with water? I mean, they're, 
that's not going to help anything. But because they were told to do it, they do it. And then it says when the... Um, it says, when the, jar, the jars have been filled, other translations say, to the brim. So the servants may not understand what's going on. They may not know why Jesus told them to fill the water, uh, to fill the jars up. And if it was me, I'll just be honest, if it was me and someone told me to do something and I didn't understand it, I'd probably be like, yeah, sure, fill it up. All right? I would not be careful to fill it up as far as it could possibly go, which shows you that these servants have a, a level of faith that was actually pretty strong. I mean, Jesus says fill it up, and they fill it up all the way. They do what he tells them to do to the best of their ability. What would have happened if they had filled it up halfway? Or a quarter of the way? Or even a third, you know, two-thirds of the way? What, it would, if they had just filled it up to the level of their faith, it would have impacted the level of the miracle, the, the magnificence of the miracle. But because they had more faith something greater came out of it. Verse 8 says, Now, Jesus said, Now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. Now, this is a whole different level of faith. Uh, it is one thing to fill something up behind the scenes. It's one thing to do, okay, I, I don't understand it, but I'm going to do what you tell me to. It's a whole different level of faith when he says, Now, take that water and take it to the master of ceremonies. Now, the whole problem here is that we've run out of wine. Right? I'm sure they had enough water. There's, there's no issue with having enough water. So for a servant to then take this water to the master of ceremonies and give it to him, I mean, this would have been very embarrassing for the servant if the master of ceremonies tried that and be like, what in the world am I supposed to do with this? You know, how is this supposed to be impressive? Maybe this would be even um, more offensive for the, the couple who's being married. Maybe this would cause them to lose more face. You know, not, not only do you not have any wine, you're trying to pass off water as wine. But amazingly, it says, so the servants followed his instructions. I mean, they take this step of faith and they go into the master's ceremonies with water and they give it to him. When the master's ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. Something happened. And we don't know exactly when it happened, but some miracle happened. Jesus performs his first miracle that we see. He turns water into wine. Now, I have to take a step aside here. Um, I know sometimes that when, when this passage is preached, people veer off into a different direction, and, and sort of a side issue becomes the main story. And I, and I don't want to do that, but I do want to address the fact that this is now wine. Um, in some of my research and, and certainly in, in things I've heard in the past, uh, people say, well, really what this was, was a, this was grape juice, all right? Uh, what, what their idea of wine was not our idea of wine, all right? This, this is, when he says that, the, the, that Jesus turned the water into wine, it's really he turned the water into grape juice. Um, I would say that that does not hold, for lack of a better term, water. No pun intended. Um, this, this was an alcoholic beverage, all right? And the only reason you would say that this is grape juice is because you have an issue with people drinking alcohol. And that's fine. If you don't want people to drink alcohol, or if you don't want to drink alcohol, that is certainly your prerogative. And, and it's, it's not an issue not to drink alcohol. But what I want to make sure we don't do is take our own ideas and put that into the story, all right? We need to find out what does the story say and let that inform our understanding. Um, I'll continue. He says, A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then, he, then when everyone has a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine, but you have kept the best until now. So why would a host bring out the best wine first and then later on bring out the less expensive wine? Because after people have been drinking enough wine, they can't really tell the difference between the good stuff and the bad stuff. All right? That doesn't happen with grape juice. Okay, I want us to understand that. Uh, you, there are other parts of Scripture where you take this word that is used for wine here, and it talks about becoming drunk on it. So there is some kind of alcohol. Now, it's probably not as strong as what we have, and that's, that's, that's fine. But there is... Jesus turns water into alcoholic wine. Okay. Now, I also want to balance that out with other passages. One I'll choose, which Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 
which says don't get drunk. So on one hand, if you don't want to drink at all because you've seen the, the danger that can come from it, you've seen the damage that can come from it, that's totally fine. No one's saying you have to drink wine. Paul told Timothy he should drink a little bit of wine. That was maybe specific to his, his situation. Uh, it's okay to drink wine if you want to drink wine, but you cannot get drunk on it, all right? Or at least you should not get drunk on it. You obviously can, but you shouldn't. All right, the Bible tells us do not get drunk, but do not get drunk, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, don't rely on some kind of liquid to fill you up when really what God wants is for the Holy Spirit to fill you up. Okay, so I know I'm, I'm, I'm sidetracked on the main issue here, but it's, which is really not about alcohol, but I felt like that needed to be addressed. So the, the servants bring the, the, wine, the water to the master ceremonies, which is now wine. He didn't know where it came from. All, right? he, all he knows is that they've given him some wine. So he calls the bridegroom over. And you can imagine the bridegroom's... Um, what he's feeling right now, all right? He knows that they don't have enough wine. And whether it's because of Jesus' disciples or or some other reason, we don't know, but they don't have enough wine. And he's about to lose face. He's about to be embarrassed, possibly for his entire life. And the master of ceremonies calls him over. And you can just sort of, I mean, I've, I've felt this before when my teacher calls me forward in high school and I didn't have my assignment ready, right? Just like, oh, I don't want to know what's going to come. They're going to call my parents. This is going to be bad. You know, only a whole lot worse. And he comes up to him, and he's expecting the master of ceremonies to, to be like, how come you don't have enough wine? You know, what, the, how come you didn't prepare the way you should? And then he, t- he tells him this, a host always serves the best wine first, but then when everyone has a lot to drink, brings it less expensive wine, but you have kept the best until now. The bridegroom probably doesn't know what's going on here. He doesn't know, I, I'm guessing he doesn't know where this wine had come from. The master of ceremonies didn't know where it came from. The only people who knew where this came from was Jesus' mother, the disciples, and the servants. But all the bridegroom knows is that I was expecting shame and embarrassment, and now I've actually been given honor. Jesus, without him knowing maybe, Jesus has completely flipped his scenario on on him. Not shame and embarrassment, but now honor. I mean, he's, you know, most people do it this way, but you, there's something special about you. You know, you didn't, you didn't leave the, the, the best stuff to last. You stopped, or you didn't leave the worst stuff to last. You saved the best until last. And we come to verse 11, the, the end of this, passage, this part of it. It says, This miraculous sign at Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. So, one day before, Jesus is gathering up his people, saying, Come and follow me. And they believe in, to, in, in him to some extent. Probably sort of like a, just a test. Okay, I'll follow you. We'll see what's going to happen. The very next day, this miracle happens and something greater happens in the disciples' minds. You know, they may have been like, oh, I'm going to check this guy out. Now I believe in him. I've seen something miraculous. I've seen something that I've never seen before. I've never seen anyone else do this before. I've never heard of anyone else do this before. There is something special about this guy and I'm going to follow him with my, my entire life. This is the first time Jesus revealed his glory. We will see other times, the Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus reveals his glory. By the way, I don't know if you've been, this is not in my notes, and I'm going to say it anyway. I don't know if you've been following the news lately, maybe about a month ago, a few weeks ago, where people were talking about what color Jesus is. All right? A lot of people were making a big deal about what color Jesus is. You know, a, lot of, a lot of our art shows him to be you know, a European, blonde hair, blue-eyed, uh, Norwegian Jesus or something like that. Some people are saying, no, Jesus is black. Some people are saying, no, Jesus is Hebrew. You know, he would have been brown. You know. I want us to understand that, that the way Jesus looks, the only time we get a glimpse of it is on the Mount of Transfiguration. All right? and, and they could not even look at him. He was, he was a shining, bright thing. It, the skin color does not matter. All right? it is, we are talking about God who is co-eternal with God the Father. And so the, something as silly as skin color does not matter when you're talking about Jesus, all right? This is the first time Jesus revealed his glory. This is the first time that anyone saw a little bit of how special he really is. Mary knew it was going to come, but this is the first time anyone sees it. And his disciples believed in him. So I want to read a couple passages from the Old Testament. The first is Hosea chapter 4, verse 7. Um, Hosea is, is speaking uh, for God, and he says, The more priests there are, the more they sin against me. 
They have exchanged the glory of God for the shame of idols. Another translation say, I will turn their glory into shame. And so he's, he's talking about people who are supposed to be followers of God, but they've started following idols. And they've, they've traded this, this amazing glory of God and they've, tra- they, they've turned it into shame because they're, they're, they're ignoring who God really is. But there's a flip side to that verse in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 19. This is now talking about God's people who, who are coming back from exile. It says, I will deal severely with all who have oppressed you. I will save the weak and the helpless ones. I will bring together those who were chased away. I will give glory and fame to my former exiles wherever they have been mocked and shamed. So on the one hand, you've got people who are supposed to be following God and they've, they've traded the glory of God for the shame of following idols, of turning their back on God. And on the other hand, you've got God who's saying, I'm going to take all your shame and embarrassment and everything that you've had that, that people have oppressed you, and I'm going to turn that into glory and honor for you. And we, that is what we see happen in this passage, right? This bridegroom. So if you want to put yourself in the place of the bridegroom, that, that makes sense. You know, you have lived a life, whether, whether you intended to or not, you have lived a life that deserves shame, right? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us has lived, lived in a way that we've brought upon ourselves shame. But because of Jesus, he flips it around and he gives us glory and honor. We get to share in his glory. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 12 says, Then the name of our Lord Jesus will be honored because of the way you live. You will be honored along with him. We get to share in his glory and honor. This is all made possible because of the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. So again, nothing be, not because of anything we've done, but because of what he's done in us allows us to share in his glory and honor. So I'm going to finish with this. I want us, as a church, Pine Ridge, do everything for the glory of God. Everything you do, no matter what it is, do it for the glory of God. Fight that thing inside you that says that it's got to be about me. Fight the egocentricness of us. And be able to live a life that says, you know what? Even if I don't get any glory here on earth, a time will come when Christ comes back in all his glory and I'm going to get to share in that. And so for right now, you know, if I pray for my son to be healed, it's not going to be about me. It's going to be about God's glory. It's not going to be about what I can turn it into and how, how you know, maybe I'm going to have a, a great healing ministry and buy myself a jet. All right? It should never be about that. It should be about how can I make the name of Jesus famous. We need to recognize that the only glory we will will ever get or should ever get comes from sharing in the glory of Jesus. So humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and let him lift you up. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come up and lead us in a time of prayer.